other way. So first, uh, the Tacoma Fire Department, we've been around for a very, very long time. I haven't been, but the department has been around that long uh, since 1880. So we predate uh, the state of Washington. The state of Washington, or Washington was a territory at the time. Um, we predate the city of Tacoma. I like to remind my boss, the city manager, of that uh, occasionally. And uh, we also predate OSM. We uh, serve the, the communities of Tacoma, uh, Fircrest, and Fife. Uh, that's about a population of close to 225,000 now. Uh, during the daytime, during the work hours, that population swells to about 370,000. Uh, we cover uh, 62 square miles with uh, 15 fire stations. And in those 15 fire stations, we have 13 fire engines, four ladders, five uh, medic ambulances, uh, two, three battalion chiefs, safety officer, and we also cross, cross staff a fire boat, hazardous materials, tech, technical rescue. So we're considered a full service fire department. Probably the only thing we don't do is airport um, uh, fire response because we don't have an airport. And we do that with uh, 388 personnel. Uh, 358 of those are uh, uniform personnel like myself, another 30 are civilians, and included in those civilians is a GIS analyst. And we're busy, we're a busy department. Uh, our call volume continues to rise. Uh, last year was over 45,000 emergency incidents. So our, our um, personnel stay very busy. We, being an urban department, we have to fight fires aggressively. Uh, that means we go inside and you can see the firefighter, this is a fire that, uh, late May this year, going inside the structure and also firefighters on top of the structure on the roof creating a vent hole so that all the dangerous smoke, gases and fire can escape so that people who are putting the fire out can get deep inside into the seat of the fire and extinguish it. And the reason why we have to be an aggressive fire department is because our buildings and our houses are close together. We, we, uh, Tacoma is fairly dense as far as old houses. And we have never had, we have never had the great fire that other um, municipalities had because we fight fires the way we do. So it's important for us to put the fire out in the room of origin or at least the structure of origin and not spread to adjacent houses, adjacent blocks, and um, uh, cause a whole lot of damage to our community. And this is an example of, a, of an older house that a, had a fire several years ago and you wouldn't know it. It looks like it's, it's a house that uh, we were able to save most of it. Uh, they had to do a lot of extensive remodeling on the inside, but we try to save the structure. And the, the fire was con contained to that particular house. It didn't spread to the adjacent houses. And because of that, if you walk around Tacoma, there's a huge inventory of really architecturally interesting residential homes uh, from the Victorian area, uh, era uh, Italianate, um, all the way through Queen Anne, then the turn of the century, there's the colonial revival homes, uh, then the arts and crafts movement, uh, lots of craftsmen, the larger size ones, uh, then also the, the typical craftsman bungalows. And that's, again, we like to take credit for that because we've been an aggressive fire department for a very long time. That does give us some problems though, because those houses continue to age, they continue to have um, issues, old knob and tube wiring that may not be updated, and that can give us more of a, a fire concern and a, a fire risk. So it's kind of a two-edged sword. So, that was sort of the typical, this is the Tacoma Fire Department, this is how we do business. But this is kind of interesting stuff I want to talk about here, is why would firefighters be natural allies in the open mapping movement? And I'm going to give you three reasons, and then I'm going to kind of get to what the, the title of the topic was, of what really is important beyond, for the fire service, and particularly for our department, beyond mapping locations of fire hydrants. Well, the first reason while firefighters would embrace open mapping 
is because they've been doing mapping for a very long time. This is inside a fire station. This is fire station number 13, if you're familiar with, with Tacoma. This is in the Proctor District. This is when our older stations, but not the oldest. This is probably, I think, 1906, 1908 in that era. But if you walk upstairs into the door against the wall, and I, I included the door jam there so that you could see the scale, there is a map of most of their response area. Uh, and if you look really closely, uh, you can see the white dots, and those dots are locations of fire hydrants. So for a very long time, we have known the importance of fire hydrants because you cannot be a, an aggressive fire department without having a good water supply and knowing where that water supply is. Also, not just in the station, but also in the, uh, in the fire engines themselves, had um, scrolling maps. And this is a little um, box that was on the dashboard of the fire engine and the little handle that turned and the map would scroll and you, as the firefighters en route to a fire would be able to determine where the, uh, the hydrants were located. And all that was done by hand as well. And when I first came on the fire department over 30 years ago, these were still in some of the fire engines. But they were done so well and they were so accurate that people didn't want to take them out. And, and a point I do want to make is um, cities like Tacoma that have publicly owned water systems usually have, have had and continue to have good data about the water system and about um, the location of hydrants and different pressure systems. Uh, you should be happy to know that we have modernized over the years. We don't have horses anymore, um, and we no longer rely on paper maps for dispatching. Uh, this is a photo from our dispatch center. That's a dispatcher. He's looking at um, the dispatch screen on his left, the one with the back, uh, black background. But to the right, there is the, um, the electronic map of our service area. And it's a dynamic system because these uh, red dots are the actual fire engines and fire trucks moving around our system. And for example, this one right here is going 30 miles an hour. Um, the others are stopped. But we, um, we dispatch no longer by the closest fire station, but by the closest available fire engine or ladder. So because it's important if you're having a heart attack or if, you're, or if there's an emergency and time is of the essence, you want the closest firefighters, not the closest fire station, because those firefighters may not be in that station, or there could just happen to be a um, fire engine going across town for another reason that's closer. We're the only agency in Pierce County who uses that. It's called um, ABL, or Automatic Vehicle Location, and along with that is um, Automatic Vehicle Routing. But this is an example of authoritative maps from the water department and from the street file along with the dynamic system that allows us to do what, what we do. And then if you, if you drill down and they open up the right screen, guess what? Hydrants are important, they're still important, and there they are because the authority of maps and, and data from the water system is put into this um, computer-aided dispatch system, and the dispatchers can tell the crews on the way to the fire where the hydrants are. And just think about how much time that saves. So firefighters, instead of stopping to look at the map, stopping to look something up where the hydrant would be or looking for it once they're there on the scene, hear from the dispatcher where the hydrants are located, close to where the fire, struck, where the fire is. And again, that helps us be an aggressive fire department because we, don't, we save a few seconds doing things like that. So reason number two, while open mapping would be important for us is we've expanded our use of mapping. Uh, we use mapping for um, decision making. We had to make a decision. Um, I was considering moving one of our ladder companies, we only have four of those, from one station, station nine, to station 13. And ladder companies are very important for rescue. So we have a number of, quite a few, as you can see from the dots in the map, buildings without sprinkler coverage meaning they don't have fire sprinklers. It's because they're old buildings, they were built before um, the codes were enacted, or 
they haven't remodeled sufficiently enough to trigger their need to have fire sprinklers. And I'm particularly concerned by the ones in blue because those are the ones above um, uh, where our fire, our ladders can reach. So we want to make sure in our deployment model, in our deployment model that we have enough resources that we can rescue folks if should there be a fire on one of those top floors. We've also used, um, expanded our use of mapping for um, station location. We've looked at opening a new station on the tide flats and we use GIS to look at the, the potential four minute response time coverage that that would provide. Uh, we use uh, GIS for and mapping for um, other decision making such as our performance uh, monitoring, make sure that we're doing uh, our response times, they need to be the way they are, and finding out those areas of town where our response times are not as good, and then maybe targeting those areas for AED placement and, and other fire education. And we've done something really interesting recently, is use mapping for equity. So you wouldn't think so much that um, the fire department would be concerned that we're providing our services equitably across our service area. Other city departments definitely need to look at that. Um, 911 is fairly accessible, and if you look at our 911 calls, we're pretty well spread out through our um, service area. But we do provide other services, non-emergency services, and one of those is CPR training. So um, we had our um, GIS intern, and I think she's here, Jasmine. She's, she's right over there, uh, Jasmine Kwan. She um, produced a map of the participants, a geolocated map of, the, of where the participants for our CPR training were coming from. And sure enough, we found that on the east side of Tacoma, we weren't getting the same participation rate as we were from, let's say, the north end or the west side of Tacoma, which are more affluent areas of town. So that became actually part of our budget process. And um, we are looking at funding to have a second CPR Sunday. We do, these, we do it once a year, and we also have other CPR training, but our, our big event is a CPR Sunday. And instead of doing it in one particular location, we're going to have two locations because the map showed we weren't supplying that or providing that um, service equitably across our service area. And I think reason number three is uh, we, we simply don't have the resources to collect and even analyze all the data that we need to to continue to do a good job for the citizens. And that has a lot to do with, with uh, the Great Recession. In the last, uh, well, since like 2008, we've lost 50 firefighter positions. And our call volume and demand for our services continues to go up. So this is a uh, photo that I actually took last night when I came home. And this is a two bay station. One's out already and the second one's heading out the door. And this station goes on a lot of calls. It's rare to find them in the house, which means they really don't have the opportunity to do much more than respond to emergency medical calls, train, do that important hands-on training that's, imp that's necessary to be uh, an aggressive firefighter. Um, do the, the inspections they need to do, do the emergency medical services training that they need to do. They really don't have time to collect the data that we would like to have to continue to um, move our department forward. So now you know why a fire service like the City of Tacoma Fire Department would be very much interested in, in uh, volunteer uh, geographic information. So what, what might that information be that, that we're looking for? Well, we can, we can all agree fire hydrants are notable. And, and I think any fire service that doesn't have the location of its fire hydrants readily mapped for firefighters to use, that would be the primary thing and the, and the most important thing to, to accomplish. But as I said, um, and I think there are a lot of areas pr um, probably throughout the world that that could really use that kind of information well mapped. But for municipalities like the city of Tacoma that have had uh, fire hydrants pretty well, um, their location pretty well established, the question is, 
what else do what else do we need? And um, we've been I, I talked about expanding our um, use of mapping and having an intern from the University of Washington Tacoma program. Uh, we uh, established a, a connection with the University of Washington Tacoma um, uh, GIS program, um, the Masters in Geotechnical. Uh, um, what's it? What, what is it, Jasmine? Geospatial technology, thanks. I just always say the GIS program, the geospatial technology. And um, uh, Professor Ricker, and I don't know if you who saw her um, presentation last, yesterday on, on hegemonic uh, discourses and drones, uh, pointed out to me, talked to me about open street maps. So I looked at it, and I also looked at open, um, there's open fire maps. And my response to hers is, you know, that's great. But there's more, and we need more than just fire hydrant location because we've known where fire hydrants have been for a long time. And her response was, well, guess what? There's an OSM conference in Seattle this summer, and why don't you go ahead and submit a presentation idea? And so you can have her to blame for the reason why I'm here right now. I'm doing it myself. All right. Um, but what else is notable be besides uh, fire hydrants. And I chose this, this photograph for a reason. If, if anybody from Tacoma recognizes, this is Wright Park. And if you've been walking through Wright Park, just about every tree, except for the, the newest ones like that, that small one in front, have tags on them that tell you what type of tree they are. So when last year, the or yesterday, the discussion was, can you, how, how far do you, and how, how deeply do you want to map into your city? What really, you know, what's, what, becomes important and what what needs to be notable and what are the what's the information that that you want mapped well for emergency work the, the type of work we do it's probably the most obvious things so for example this is a, a giant red oak um, at uh, Wright Park and it's a state champion tree so of course that's that's going to be something that's important to to map and for us it would be things that would impede our ability to get to an emergency scene. So remember, aggressive fire department, we want to be there quickly, fire grows quickly, we want to get inside, we want to get on top, we want to get a water connection, we want to put the fire out before it spreads. So things that slow us down, cobblestone streets, and traffic calming, such as traffic circles or um, uh, traffic speed bumps, those would definitely be things that would be helpful for us to have mapped because they're not part of the regular street file that we have access to. And then on the scene, once we're on the scene, our firefighters arrive on the scene, they don't go crashing through the door initially. Someone does a 360 to check to see what are the dangerous things, the hazardous things immediately around the fire. That if the fire were to spread, could cause a problem, or these things could cause a problem to the primary fire. And I just chose one section, which would be fuels, and of course, propane uh, tanks, uh, natural gas, and diesel are things that can be around buildings that we really want to know about. <laughs> and I do, um, I do want to talk about propane a little bit, because of all things propane tanks are probably the most important for me. I mean, you hear about natural gas explosions. There was one um, up in Seattle, one uh, elsewhere recently. And what can happen is the natural gas leaks inside a confined space. It reaches its, um, in, uh, the con concentration is its flammability range. It's like 15, 5 to 15%. There's an, ex an ignition source. It will explode. Propane doesn't need um, to be confined to explode. Moreover, natural gas, lighter than air, so outdoors if natural gas es escapes, it disperses to the atmosphere, but propane is heavier than air, and it will follow the gravity gradient until it finds a uh, ignition source. And if everything's just right, uh, an explosion can ensue, and that's what happened to us in 2007 at the Atlas Foundry where um, there was an explosion because a, a truck was filling up a propane tank and um, uh, there was a problem with the hose. 
propane leaked, there was an initial explosion, and then finally a very large explosion that rocked the community um, when, the, when the truck itself exploded. So I'm very much concerned about propane tanks of all sizes that are fixed. Because small barbecue propane tank, if it's next to a fire, you can pick it up and move it away from the fire, right? But uh, if it's a fixed tank, not so much. And where we are, I think I have my particular concern is right at where a business abuts a residential area. And these are examples of two gas stations. The gas station has a propane tank at the edge of its property, but right on the other side of the property is a residence. So um, we would very much like to know, and we know where a lot of these are, but it's very important when, um, when a fire happens that we know that that tank is outside and it would be very helpful for the firefighters to hear in route to the fire, like they know where the, hear the, where the hydrants are, if they could hear from our dispatch center where things like propane tanks are. And we have it documented in our um, inspection, and the city does, of the gas station, but the relation that there's a residence next door may not be obvious from that piece of information. And a map is an ideal thing that shows how close the, 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 um, the propane tank is to, uh, to a residence. Uh, we also do a non-emergency work, and so um, we're willing and be very much interested in uh, mapping, um, to continue the metaphor, um, less important trees. Uh, this one is a mountain ash. Um, I walk through uh, Wright Park with my wife, Melissa. Um, she always gets, she identifies the tree long before I can see what the, um, what the tag is. I always have to look at the tag. Um, but along those lines, we also do planning. And we've, we're coming up with a um, all hazard risk assessment. And um, in that, we're looking at a, a lot of different things. And that would lend itself to different and more extensive uh, uh, data about our service area. And uh, the top one, I don't know if you can see that. It's probably a little too small. That's where the bridges are in Tacoma. You can see that's just a very bird's eye view of it. And then also down, the, the second one is another map in here, which is um, trails and pedestrian ways in, in the city. But that's about the level of um, detail we have now. So that could be very much expanded with um, volunteered information. And then we do other things besides, um, uh, besides emergency response. Uh, we have other roles, uh, emergency management, disaster preparedness. Um, we do building plan review and fire code. And we also have harbor master um, responsibilities. So all those things would lend themselves to um, to uh, volunteer geographic information. But really, what I, what I want to leave you with is there's a lot of work that can be done that, that firefighters would be very much interested in. The most important work are things related to emergency response and the, the emergencies we do. Uh, those would be things like impediments on the way to fires, and I talked about like cobblestone streets, um, traffic calming devices, and then also the hazards immediately around a a fire incident. And with that, uh, any questions for me? Do you have? <laughs> I've never had a. Uh, you know, I don't know if we chief tell me the right answer. <laughs> yeah, I, and, and I won't even guess how many there are. No, you don't. Uh, okay, so one yeah. thing I noticed on your map, you've got all red fire hydrants. Now, in my work with a dozen or so fire departments, mm -hmm. we change the color of our maps uh, according to pressure. Mean, yes, yeah. volume, yeah. pressure, and, yeah. and, and, volume. and rate. You know, right. so right. you get a green one, you get a yellow one, you get a red one, and then when you're when you're going to the incident, you could just stage around that big one. You know, that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. Right. So in Tacoma, uh, we are very fortunate of with to have Tacoma water. And the, the water system is extremely good. So when I first started with, with the Tacoma Fire Department, uh, we had to learn the different types of hydrants. There were green top ones, yellow tops, and red top, depending on volume and, and pressure. And right now, they're pretty much virtually all the same. You know, they're, they're all top level. So when you look at hydrants now, the public hydrants are all, all very good. They all have very good pressure for the most part. Uh, so really that, 
for us, that isn't really a distinction of do we want to grab the hydrant with the, it's, it's really, they're all pretty much the same. Uh, we do run into difficulties in private hydrants. Uh, Point Defiance Park, that, that's an issue for us. Um, sometimes uh, private yard hydrants out on the port and on the terminals, those can be concerned. And mostly because they don't um, exercise them as much and maintain them as much and as, and as um, routinely as Tacoma Water does. Exactly, yeah. He was, but I'll get right to you. Hi. Is, is uh, the dispatch software directly tied into OSM? No, it is not. How is this information getting relayed to the firefighters then? So uh, we would have it, so, so we're not using OSM right now. The dispatch system we have is a Northrop Grumman system. It's kind of at the end of its life. Uh, we're moving to another system which will probably have more functionality but it still won't have the kind of detail that we would really need. Uh, the way I envision OSM, and I'm, I'm a complete neophyte when it comes to OSM, I'll admit that, and I think I've said probably at least four naive things about it, so um, I may say a fifth one now, is that um, we would probably have that as for initially as a separate system. Then ultimately what we'd like to do is feed that information into the, um, the, uh, the other system. Yeah, we don't have OSM running right now. No, we do not. But that's what we—that's what I'd imagine the use it, it would be. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, if our next speaker would like to come get set up, we can still do some, a few more questions while they do that. She had a question. So a friend of mine is an emergency manager in Christchurch, New Zealand, and he did his master's thesis on building interior information. He was collecting purely text information about things like where are the environmental control panel, where are the necessary keys, where are the bulkheads. And I was asking him about 3D information, like stairwells mm. and that kind of thing. Is that at all useful? It is, and we do, um, in addition to exterior mapping, we, we also map and, and have plans of buildings and so uh, firefighters carry books of um, high rises, for example, or, or complex buildings, and a, a lot of that detail is put in those books. But they're still hand drawn, and we really like to move past that. Uh, good stuff. All right, well, again, th thank you very much for your time this afternoon. It was um, really uh, um, a privilege for me to be able to come here and talk to you and, and talk about what the needs of the fire service would be when it comes to um, open maps and volunteer geographic information. So thank you very much.